All right, so our next topic uh, uh, in general chemistry two is kinetics. And what kinetics is, is uh, it is the study of how fast or slow a chemical reaction occurs. All right, so I put uh, the, the words fast and slow in um, quotations because usually uh, when we're talking about fast or slow, we're talking about speed or velocity. And obviously when we're talking about a chemical reaction, we're not gonna be referring to the velocity of the individual molecules. So what do we mean by a uh, chemical reaction occurring faster or slower? Well, let's look at this plot on the uh, right side. So it turns out we have, uh, we're looking at two different reactions, A plus B going to C, and then X plus Y going to Z. And if you follow these two reactions as a function of time, so we've got the stopwatch in the middle, uh, timing how long it, uh, how much time has elapsed, you will see that the uh, reaction between A and B is uh, producing product at a faster rate than X plus Y is producing its product, Z. So by the, the, by the last frame, a little after 45 seconds, uh, A plus B is completely done reacting. All of the A and B is gone, uh, and there's only C uh, remaining. And so essentially that reaction would stop. Whereas in that same time frame, uh, you still have quite a bit of X and Y remaining. You've produced some Z, but um, not all of it. So that reaction is still going. So obviously we would say that A, uh, the reaction between A and B is a faster reaction, X and Y is a slower reaction. So what are we really trying to, uh, what are we really looking at? What we're really looking at is the change in uh, amount of the reactants uh, and products. So we're actually, we could, if we wanted to quantify it, what we could do is we could measure the concentration of the reactants and products and uh, measure that as a function of time, and that would give us an idea of how fast or slow a chemical reaction is occurring. When we do that, we would call that the reaction rate. So the reaction rate is the change in concentration, so we'll use the symbol delta again, and if we're just looking at the first reaction, let's say we're looking at the change in concentration of A over the change in time. All right, and those uh, calculations would, uh, of course, be calculated the same way as we calculated the change in anything. Uh, change in concentration would be the concentration at whatever time you stop at, so the final concentration minus the initial concentration, whatever you started with. And then, of course, the same would go for the change in time. Final minus initial. Now we're also gonna be talking about temperature quite a bit in kinetics, and so just to differentiate between those, uh, when we always write uh, the lowercase t, we're referring to time, and when we write the uppercase t, we're referring to temperature. So what would be the units for uh, the reaction rate, or rate of change as we're also gonna call it? Well, of course we got change in concentration on top, and usually when we're talking about brackets, we're using the concentration term similarity, and then change in time. Turns out uh, most reactions uh, react pretty fast, so we usually refer to it as uh, change in time with units of seconds. So our units for reaction rate would be molarity per second. So it turns out that there, there are three things that uh, need to occur uh, for a reaction to occur. All right, the first one's uh, pretty straightforward. All right, so if I want that reaction between A and B to occur, and I have, uh, say, a beaker of A and a beaker of B, we know that they're not going to react until I combine them. So I pour some of A into B. And now the reason why they're not going to react is because those reactant molecules need 
to come into contact with each other. They actually need to collide. So the first thing that needs to happen is the molecules need to collide. But it turns out that they also need to collide in a specific way. So that's the second thing that needs to, uh, to occur. The molecules need to collide with uh, the proper orientation. Uh, the other thing we uh, call that is an effective collision. To see what I mean by uh, that, let's take a look at a specific example. So the reaction is uh, between two NOCl molecules. Turns out when they react, they will produce two uh, nitrogen monoxide molecules and a chlorine molecule. Now if you think about what needs to happen, so if we're going to make a chlorine molecule, the two chlorine atoms are going to have to form a bond between themselves, form a covalent bond. So obviously, uh, since we know that a covalent bond is the overlapping of orbitals, the chlorine atoms, the two chlorine atoms, need to collide. So if an oxygen, if the two oxygen atoms on uh, the molecules collide, that's not going to lead to this reaction. So we call that an ineffective collision. That's also not going to, this reaction is also not going to occur if an oxygen atom bumps into uh, a chlorine atom. The only way that this reaction is going to occur is, is if the two chlorine atoms collide and start to form an, a, a covalent bond, and that probably starts the process of this chlorine nitrogen uh, bond breaking. And then you would have your reaction occur, producing two nitrogen monoxide uh, molecules and that new chlorine molecule with the uh, covalent bond between them. So it turns out every single reaction has an effective collision or a proper orientation in which the molecules need to collide. If they don't collide in that proper orientation, they're not going to react. The third thing that needs to occur is the, in terms of energy. So it turns out the molecules need to collide with enough energy to overcome something called the activation energy. And when we refer to the energy, we're talking about the kinetic energy of the molecules. So they need to, they need to collide with uh, enough energy to overcome the activation energy. And we'll be talking about the activation energy quite a bit. And so we usually abbreviate E sub A, so the energy of the activation energy, uh, activation energy rather. All right, so now let's uh, talk about what the activation energy is and why it's there for every reaction. Well, the best way to show uh, the activation energy of a reaction is to uh, look at something called the potential energy diagrams of a reaction. So this is what we're going to draw next. So potential energy diagrams. So essentially what these do is they plot the potential energy while the reaction is happening. Okay? So let's just think about a simple reaction between reactants. Go to products. So we're going to say the reactants, whatever they are, go to products. All right, and what the potential energy diagrams are is they actually plot the potential energy of the system as a function of something called the reaction progress, which is how far along the reactant reaction is. Okay, and what that means is essentially reactions aren't instantaneous. Okay, so if, the, if we look back at the reaction between two NOCl molecules and to make NO. Uh, to see and see chlorine. 
Well, as these molecules are colliding, it's not an instantaneous process that produces the two NOs and the Cl. As these uh, chlorine atoms collide, their orbitals start to overlap, and that will start to form a covalent bond. So there's a, a spectrum from when it starts to when it eventually forms. And then the other thing that's going to occur is that these bonds, the bonds between the chlorine and nitrogen atoms, are also going to start to break. And there's a sort of uh, process involved in that breaking of that bond. It's not an instantaneous uh, event. That bond length probably lengthens for a while until the, the orbitals no longer overlap with any high probability, and then that bond is broken. Okay, so reactions aren't an instantaneous process. There's a progress or a pro, um, progress to them, um, or a progression. That's the word I'm looking for, a progression to them. So uh, it turns out there's really only two uh, types of potential energy diagrams, all right, and that deals with how the potential energy is changing for a reaction. Uh, the two scenarios are either the reactants are higher potential energy than the products, or the products are higher potential energy. So let's take the first plot where, we're, where we will say that the reactants are lower potential energy than the product. So at the beginning of the day, at the beginning of this reaction, we have reactants. And at the end of the reaction, we have products. And we would say that this, in this scenario, the products have higher potential energy. The potential energy doesn't go in a straight line from reactants to products in chemical reactions. It actually would increase and then fall down to the potential energy of the uh, products. In the other scenario, the reactants might have higher potential energy than the products. So at the beginning of the reaction progress, we would have all reactants, and at the end, we'd have products. And again, it's not a linear uh, decline this time in potential energy from reactants to products. It first goes up, and then come down to the potential energy of the products. Oops. Now these are the two types of reactions because in terms of potential energy, there's only two types of reactions. If the reactants are higher potential energy than the products, we know that the system is coming down in potential energy. Where is that potential energy going? It's going to the surroundings. So this is an example of an exothermic reaction where the enthalpy is zero, or less than zero, negative. And of course, if we're going up in potential energy from reactants to products, that means we're looking at an endothermic reaction where the enthalpy change is positive, greater than zero. Now the activation energy, which we started uh, this process wanting to learn about, is uh, uh, found by looking at the difference in potential energy between the reactants and the highest potential energy, uh, what we're going to call transition state, of the reaction progress. And so if we wanted to draw it, uh, the activation energy would be the difference in potential energy between the reactants and the highest point of this reaction potential energy diagram. So if we wanted to label it, this would be the activation energy for this reaction. The same is true for the exothermic reaction. The activation energy is the difference in potential energy of the reactants to the maximum potential energy of the reaction progress. So that's where we can see the uh, activation energy. So if we wanted to put that in words, what the activation energy is, it is the difference, the difference in potential energy between the reactants and the highest potential energy transition state. We're calling them transition states because from this point to this point, we're not really sure what we have here. They're not reactant molecules anymore, and they're certainly not product molecules yet. They're transitioning from reactants to products, and so that's what we call them, transition states.
Now, for these potential energy diagrams, we can also determine the enthalpy change for these reactions. And we know this from previous uh, lectures, that the uh, enthalpy change is the difference in potential energy between the reactants and products. And so you can easily see that on these uh, plots as well. Here, for the endothermic reaction, it's the, react the difference in potential energy from the reactants to the products. And the same is true over here, but of course we're going down in potential energy, so it is a negative value. So that is the enthalpy change for the exothermic reaction. Now the uh, shape of these curves may change. The activation energies may be higher or lower. The enthalpy change can be higher or lower. But the general shape for these potential energy diagrams is always going to look like this. The reactants are always going to be lower potential energy than the products for endothermic reactions. And they're always going to go up to the activation energy first before coming down to the products. For the exothermic reactions, the uh, products are always going to be lower potential energy than the reactants. And again, in between, uh, the potential energy is going to go up to the activation energy before coming down. So the third thing that needs to happen for the reaction to occur is the uh, molecules need enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. That's why this is also a lot of times called the activation barrier. The reactants need to come to have enough kinetic energy to overcome uh, this activation energy. So that's the barrier for them to complete this reaction. Now the next thing we need to talk about is why does every reaction have this high potential energy um, uh, transition state which leads to those activation energies.